Karen from TrueCode, and I want to thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, I know how hectic things must be for all of you right now, and we're really happy that you can join us um, remotely for this webinar. We're very excited for our 2020. Um, if you've joined us in the past, welcome back. And if this is your first TrueCode educational webinar, we're really happy you've joined us um, for what we hope is a very valuable experience for you. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with TrueCode, we offer an encoder solution that's used by hundreds of hospitals, um, consulting firms, and payers. And if you've never seen how TrueCode works, it's a pretty unique solution that not only improves coding accuracy and productivity, but it also delivers license fee savings uh, oftentimes as well. So we encourage you to view a demonstration when you have a chance. Uh, we'd love to sh show you what we have to offer. And we offer public demos on a monthly basis. You can sign up from our website. All right, so um, I would love to introduce you to today's presenter, Lori Amendi. Lori is a product specialist here at TrueCode. She holds RHIA and CCS credentials, and she has over 20 years of experience in the health information management field. She's worked in a variety of healthcare settings with a focus on both inpatient and outpatient coding. Before I hand it off to Lori, I just wanna review a few tips um, to make sure you have a successful webinar. First, all attendees are in listen-only mode, so that means you need to use your control panel to communicate. This control panel is on the right-hand side of your screen. You can minimize it um, so that you can see Lori's presentation better. Um, you can collapse and expand it by clicking on the little red box uh, with the arrow. If you'd like to ask a question, and we love questions, you can do that in the questions section of the panel, and that's towards the bottom. So to ask a question, just click on the little plus button and that will open up a text box. You can type your question and submit it. We are gonna hold questions till the end um, of the webinar and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, so feel free to ask them. You can submit them at any time. Um, I also wanna point out handouts for today's presentation are um, under the handout section. We also sent them um, in a reminder email earlier today. So hopefully you had a chance to print those out if you wanted to. And finally, and most importantly, we wanna make sure you receive your CEUs. So first thing tomorrow morning, we'll be sending out an email to everybody who registered. Um, everybody who attended will receive a link to a brief webinar evaluation. We just ask that you complete that evaluation and once you submit your response, you'll be able to download your AHIMA CEU certificate. So if you have any questions, you can always send them to me by email and you can just respond to any of the emails you've received regarding the webinar and that will go to me and i'll make sure you get your ceu certificate if you have any issues so um, feel free to do that all right i think that covers it all with that i am going to hand it over to lori thanks everyone lori are you there you might be on mute okay well thanks sharon hi everyone and welcome to the webinar I'm here, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Can you hear us, Lori? Okay, great, thanks, Sharon. Hi, yep, I can hear you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're very excited to kick off our TrueCode webinar series, and um, hopefully we can provide you some helpful information today. Our webinar for today is coding for skin grafts, skin flaps, and related procedures. Okay, so our learning objectives for today are going to be a review of the anatomy and physiology of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia, an overview of skin grafts and skin flaps. And then we're going to look at correct coding assignment for skin graft and skin flap procedures for both ICD-10 and CPT. And also a look at some additional related procedures. And then finally, an exploration of new technology related to skin grafting and skin substitute products. So first off, I wanted just to do a quick review of the anatomy and physiology of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia. And starting with the skin, it is the largest organ of the body. It functions as a defense mechanism. It regulates body temperature and senses pain and heat. The skin is divided into three layers. So we have the epidermis, which is gonna be the principal barrier. The dermis contains connective tissue that provides skin elasticity. And then finally, we have the, epiderm the hypodermis, which is also called the subcutaneous tissue. So a couple of facts about our skin. 
The average adult has about 21 square feet of skin and it weighs approximately nine pounds. There are more than 11 miles of blood vessels and we have about 300 million skin cells. Next, we have our subcutaneous tissue. This is gonna be the layer between the dermis and the fascia. The subcutaneous tissue is gonna insulate the body, it cushions the body, and it binds our skin to the underlying tissue. The subcutaneous tissue is made up of adipose tissue, also called fat cells. The collagen and elastin fibers connect subcutaneous tissue to dermis. And then there's also various other components, such as our vessels, nerves, and then hair follicle roots as well. Okay, then the fascia is going to be made up of sheets of connective tissue that's below the skin. The fascia includes, encloses our organs and it separates muscles. We also have several layers of fascia, which include the superficial, deep, and visceral. The superficial fascia is mostly found in the abdominal wall, the perineum, and the limbs. The deep fascia surrounds the bones, nerves, muscles, and blood vessels. And then we have our visceral fascia, which, which covers organs, like the heart. So the pericardium is an example of the visceral fascia. Okay, so sometimes skin grafting and skin flaps are used interchangeably. So I wanted to just take a quick look at the difference between the two procedures. I do have a video here from Dr. Parker from Skin Cancer Consultations, and he provides a good overview on the difference between a skin graft and a skin flap. So we'll listen here to that. Lori, the Karen, audio... are you hearing? No. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm not hearing it. Okay. I don't know what happened there. That's okay, though. We'll go ahead and just um, talk about that a little bit. Basically, what Dr. Parker is saying is that, you know, the skin graft procedure is a, really the, the easiest procedure, but the problem with that sometimes is that the pig, there's pigment differences when a piece is moved from one area to another, so that kind of makes it um, a, di a disadvantage. The skin flap when they rotate the skin from one area to the other, um, you have kind of the same, it, it makes a better cosmetic result, but then the disadvantage to that is that we have a, a bigger scar once they're done. So that's kind of how he explained the difference between those two. And I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure why we weren't getting any volume. But to take that information a little bit further, in a skin graft, the tissue is completely freed from its bed without a blood supply. So the graft is going to need a local blood supply to survive and the recipient bed must have healthy tissue. So some of the common donor sites that we see are gonna be the leg, the upper arm, forearm, and buttock. And in addition to skin, other tissue grafts that we'll see are fascia, fat, tendons, vessels, and bone. And then on the other hand, when a skin flap is performed, the tissue is transferred with its blood supply intact. So skin flaps can be used for poor recipient beds, and they're also gonna be used to reconstruct specific structures. So reconstruction of the breast or the pharynx, and then also very commonly used in facial reconstruction after skin cancer excision. Okay, so now that we've talked about the difference between the two procedures, I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about the types of skin grafts. So for ICD-10 purposes, skin grafts are gonna be classified as split thickness and full thickness. And then for CPT, as we'll see a little bit later, we also have the option of epidermal and dermal skin grafts. The split thickness graft is gonna be the entire epidermis and part of the dermis. It's gonna be our most used graft and it's commonly used for large wounds and burn treatment. It can be used under unfavorable conditions and it generally has the best take. However, the skin graft can shrink and like we mentioned, there could also be pigment differences. The full thickness graft is gonna be the entire epidermis and dermis. This graft usually pr provides a better cosmetic result, so it's usually gonna be used like on the face and the hands. The full thickness grafts do have a little bit of a higher failure rate, but they don't contract um, like a split thickness graft would. The epidermal graft is composed of only the epidermis. This graft can be used in place of a split thickness graft in some cases. So the benefit of the epidermal graft is that the dermis is left behind. And so it eliminates that wound that you would normally have at the donor site that can be painful. It also has a risk of infection. And because they're leaving the dermis, this procedure causes minimal pain. So it can actually be performed as an outpatient with local anesthesia. And then finally, we have the dermal graft, which is again, only the dermis. 
And during this type of procedure, they take the split thickness graft, they take the dermis portion to cover the wound, and then the epidermis is actually returned to the donor site. So this, because skin pigment is contained in the basal cell layer of the epidermis, the, by only using the dermis, that reduces that um, pigment difference in that area. And then the other advantage is that when they return the epidermis to the donor site, that helps promote healing and reduce scarring at that donor site. Okay, so now I have some the sources of the skin graft. And skin grafts can come from many different sources, including the patient's own skin, and we call this the autograft. This is also going to include the tissue cultured autograft. And so when they do the tissue cultured autograft, the graft is grown or cultured from a small sample of the patient's own skin. The cells within the epidermis of the skin are separated, and then they provide them nutrients that kind of help those cells to multiply. And this then forms sheets of skin. One interesting fact about this is that oftentimes mouse cells are actually used to help promote the cell growth. And Epicil is an example, it's a brand name of a tissue cultured autograph, and that is what we have here on this photo, is uh, uh, what those sheets of skin look like after they've been cultured. Next we have the allograft, which is using skin obtained from another person, so an example would be cadaver skin. Then we have a xenograft, which is skin from a non-human source. So an example would be a porcine-derived graft. And then we have our skin substitutes. And these can be a combination of biological and non-biological material. An example of this would be Integra. This is a graft that's made up of collagen protein from cows, and then they actually mix in a thin layer of silicone for that type of a graft. We're going to start with I-10, and we're going to talk a little bit about the actual coding for the skin graft. So if we do a search, in our index for skin grafts, we can see that we have the option of using either replacement or supplement. And a quick review of those RIT operations. For replacement, it's putting in or on a biological material that takes the place of all of, or a portion of a body part. So with replacement, some of the body part is gonna come out and then we're gonna replace that body part with the device. And in this case, the device would be the graft. For supplement, that is going to be putting in or on a biologic or synthetic material that reinforces or augments the body part. And with supplement, the body part does not come out, but the device is going to be used to help us fix that body part. If we take a look at the PCS table, we can see that our approach for the skin graft is going to default to external. And then we also, from there, we will need to choose a device and we'll need to choose a qualifier. So a look a little bit closer at the device values. The autologous tissue substitute is going to include our autograft and then also our tissue cultured autograft. The non-autologous tissue is going to be the allograft, such as the cadaver skin, xenografts uh, that are derived from non-humans, such as the porcine. And then we have our biological derived material. An example of that would be Integra that came from the cow collagen. And then finally, we have the synthetic substitute. And uh, I didn't, I had kind of a hard time finding an example of the Synthetic substitute, most of the products that I've seen were a mixture of both biologic and synthetic material. Um, but I, one thing I did want to note is if a graft has a synthetic material mixed with a biologic material, it would be considered non-autologous. And this is actually a photo here of the EasyDerm porcine xenograft. So just to give you an idea of what that product looks like. Okay, so sometimes it can be hard to know which type of material is being used. The index does provide some guidance for some of the specific brand names of the different materials. So for example, if we do a search for Epicel, we're gonna be directed to the autologous tissue, and Integra is gonna tell us that we need to use the non-autologous. Coding Clinic does have some articles that talk about specific brand names as well, so that can be helpful. And then I also found that if you Google the product name, you can fairly easily find out what the product is derived from, so that can be helpful as well. Okay, and then for the qualifier value options, um, of course, we're gonna have partial thickness or full thickness, and we defined those just a little bit earlier. One thing I wanted to point out is that Coding Clinic has stated that the qualifier full thickness is the default value for bioengineered skin substitutes unless otherwise specified. So that's gonna be some good information to keep in mind when we're choosing the qualifier for those types of products. And then finally, we have the cell suspension technique, and this is actually a new qualifier for fiscal year 2020. And we're going to talk about this just a little bit more when we get into our new technology section.
Okay, so I wanted to look at some specific examples that we have for coating skin grafts in I-10. In this first case was an 85-year-old male, had non-healing ulcers of the ankle and heel. They required excisional debridement to the tendon, and then they went ahead and applied the Theraskin. So for this type of case, we would report code replacement uh, of the left foot skin with non-autologous tissue substitute. And because this graft was applied at the skin level and the debridement included the tendon, we can assign an additional code for excision of the angle tendon. This is a patient whose status post transmetatarsal amputation. They presented for non-excisional debridement of the dehisc wound and then an epifix graft was applied. So in this case, we would assign, again, replacement of the foot with non-autologous tissue. We would not assign a code for the debridement in this case since it was non-excisional and not deeper than the skin graft. Okay, so next, a patient diagnosed with buccal intraoral lymphatic malformation undergoes excision of the lesion, and they did grafting with an oasis acellular matrix. NI10 is the appropriate device character synthetic substitute or non-autologous tissue substitute. So the OASIS acellular matrix is porcine derived, so it would be reported as non-autologous tissue substitute. And they do go on to say that if the material is derived from a living or biologic basis, it would be coded as non-autologous. Otherwise, it's gonna be considered synthetic. And we talked about this just a second ago, but if, there, if the living or biologic material is mixed with synthetic material, we're gonna go ahead and, and code those to non-autologous. And then a couple of additional notes. If two separate products are used, so one being synthetic and one being biologic, we can code both of those separately. And then tissue engineered products may be cellular or acellular, so we may, be, may see those described as either one. Okay, so also for fiscal year 2020, we had a couple of changes to the guidelines. I wanted to touch on these because they do impact some of our coding for the skin graft. The first change is the components of a procedure guideline. So the components of a procedure that are integral to the root operation are not coded separately. They did add an exception to this guideline. And if a patient has a mastectomy followed by breast reconstruction, both the resection and the replacement of the breast are now coded separately. The next guideline change we had is regard, in regards to the excision of graft guideline. If an autograft is obtained from a different procedure site in order to complete the objective of, of the procedure, a separate procedure is coded. And the new exception to this is when the seventh character qualify, qualifier fully specifies the site where the autograft was obtained. And the example that they did provide us is replacement of the breast with a DIEP flap. And in that case, the excision of the flap is not coded separately because the qualifier value specifies the site of the autograft. And I did include a snippet here of the seventh character qualifiers that are included in the replacement table. So if we do have one of these types of autographs, we wouldn't code the excision separately in those situations. Okay, and then the final PCS change I wanted to talk about was a table change in the skin and breast body system. The external approach value X was deleted for the breast body part, and this change is gonna allow us to, to distinguish between procedures that are performed on the skin of the chest as opposed to those that are performed on breast tissue. So procedures performed on the skin of the chest will be classified to the body part value five with the approach value X for external. And before we move on to CPT, I did have a couple of examples of breast replacement procedures uh, that I thought might be helpful to take a look at. This first one is a patient who is admitted for prophylactic mastectomy and bilateral DIEP flap reconstruction and for this case, we would go ahead and report replacement of the breast using the DIEP flap, and then we could go ahead and code resection of the breast for the mastectomy. And this particular article did go on to say that the, breast, the mastectomy with breast reconstruction can both be coded because the primary objective of the surgery was to remove the cancerous tissue, and that the reconstruction then is an additional objective. Now this one um, is actually a very recent coding clinic. This one came from first quarter 2020, so I wanted to go ahead and include it. It does provide some good information about a specific type of, of graft, skin graft. So this is a patient who has status post mastectomy. They presented for delayed reconstruction. The reconstruction was performed using a left vertical upper gracilis musculocutaneous flap. And so in this case, we would report replacement of the breast with the autologous tissue substitute. And we can code also excision of the left upper leg muscle for the gracilis flap. 
And the reason why this one, we don't currently have a qualifier value to identify this type of flap. So we're going to use qualifier Z for no qualifier. And then because we don't have, because the qualifier doesn't specify where the graph came from, we can go ahead and code an, ex uh, an excision of the, the muscle because in that case, both codes are going to be needed to fully capture the procedure performed. Okay, and then in this last example, this is actually a root operation where we're going to use supplement for the grafting procedure. And so this is a patient with cleft lip and palate, and they were seen for closure. A dermal autograft was harvested from the hip and was placed into the cleft. And in this case, then we're going to report supplement right maxilla with autologous tissue for the closure. And then we can also code excision of the left upper leg for the harvesting. And the root operation was used in this case because the body part was not removed, but the graft was used to repair the, the cleft. And because the autograft was taken from a different procedure site, we can code that as an additional excision procedure. That wraps up our I-10 information. So I wanted to jump into coding for skin grafts in CPT. Uh, CPT classifies skin replacement surgery as surgical preparation and topical placement of an autograft including the tissue cultured autograft or skin substitute graft. And it does also go on to say that the graft is anchored using the individual's choice of fixation. So in CPT, it's gonna be very similar to ITIN in terms of how we classify the source of the graft. The autograft and tissue cultured autograft are gonna be reported with codes 15050 through 15261. And then our skin substitutes are gonna be reported with codes 15271 through 78. And this section is actually going to include the non-autologous human, such as the cadaver skin, the non-human, such as the porcine derived, and then also any of our biological or non-biological products. A couple of points to remember for CPT is that the skin graft codes include the harvest and or application of the skin graft, and then the repair of the donor site is included unless that closure requires a skin graft or local flap. And in that case, then the repair could be separately reported. And then as we previously talked about, CPT gives us four options for the type of skin graft. So we have um, the epidermal, the dermal, slit thickness, or full thickness. And then if, this, if a skin substitute material is used, we can report that separately for the, the material using the correct PIX PIX code. Okay, so a little bit more about the measurement of the, the actual area that we're grafting. The measurement applies to the size of the recipient area. We can sum the surface area of the wound if they're grouped together in the code description, so similar to what we do with suture repair. The measurement of 100 square centimeters in the code description is going to apply to adults and children who are 10 years and older. And then for any of the children that are younger than 10, we're going to need to use the percentage of body surface to determine the size. Okay, so again, I have a couple scenarios here to, to take a look at. The first one is a powdered form of human oligraft, which is often reported as a skin substitute, is applied to assist healing in uneven wounds. May the application of the powdered form be reported with 15271, which is the application of the skin substitute. And it is not going to be appropriate to report a code for the skin substitute. The powdered form does not involve fixation, and remember that was part of our guidelines that there we could use the fixation of choice. But because this does not involve fixation, it would be more equivalent to placing a dressing. Okay, so the next is a question regarding the measurement of the wound. Does the measurement take place pre or post application of the graft? And the size of the wound should be measured after wound preparation and has been performed. And the size should be based on the skin, the, based on the size of the wound and not actually the amount of the graft used. So very important when we're looking at the measurement. Okay, a split thickness graft was taken from the forearm and applied to two separate wounds, and because two separate wounds were treated, is it appropriate to code the skin graft procedure twice? And we would not report it twice. The size of the two recipient sites in the same anatomical group could be summed together, and in that case, we would just report the one skin graft code, and it should include both sizes of those wounds. And then we have a, a Question, is it appropriate to report codes 15271 through 15278 when a physician affixes aplograft or dermograft using Steri-Strips? And it is appropriate, and in CPT it does say, the guideline states that the graft can be anchored using the individual's choice of fixation 
And so in that case, it would include the series strip, so we could report that as the skin replacement surgery. Okay, so some related uh, procedures when it comes to CPT. In some circumstances, we can code the surgical preparation codes separately. Those are gonna be reported with codes 15002 through 005. And the surgical preparation describes the initial service related to preparing a clean and viable wound surface. In all cases, appreciable non-viable tissue is removed. The surgical preparation codes are not intended to report simple debridement or wound cleansing. And a couple of examples here on that. If it's appropriate, um, is it appropriate to report surgical preparation for the following procedure? The recipient bed was debrided of all loose debris in preparation for the surface skin. In this scenario, simple debridement is performed, and so it would not be appropriate to report the 15002 for the surgical preparation. This one, on the other hand, is a patient who had chronic ulceration, and in this case, the wound was excisionally debrided, full thickness, and they did document that there was a lot of overlying exudate, bioburden, and necrotic tissue. The theraskin was prepared and trimmed. And so based on the documentation of the full thickness debridement, and because there was a lot of ne necrotic tissue and bioburden, it would be appropriate in this case to report the surgical preparation of the wound. Okay, so now I think we have for all the information for CPT and I-10 for skin grafting, I wanted to go ahead and move on to coding for skin flaps. And I'll start with how skin flaps are classified. One thing I'll say um, is that these definitions really come into play more when we're coding CPT than they do in PCS, but I thought it would be good to start with these just to kind of give everyone an idea of what we're looking at with the different types of flaps. So we have um, skin flaps that they could include the method of transfer, tissue type, location in relation to the defect, and then finally we have our blood supply. The method of transfer could be advancement, rotation, transposition, or interpolation. Some information about the interpolation flap is that this is a type of flap that's usually performed in two stages. So in the first stage, the skin flap is removed and it's sewn into the defect, but they actually leave a bridge of tissue between the two areas, and that's usually called the flap pedicle. And this pedicle is gonna supply the flap with blood for a couple of weeks until the second stage. And at that point, then they can cut the pedicle and then complete the repair. In addition to skin, flaps can include the fascia, muscle, or composite. So meaning that the flap is made up of several different types of tissue. Some examples that we see are skin and fascia, also referred to as fasciocutaneous. Skin, fat, and muscle that we refer to as myocutaneous. And a good example of this, that would be a tram flap. Next, we have the location in relation to the defect. So the local flap is when the skin and underlying tissue that lie adjacent to the wound is gonna be transferred to repair the wound. So many of our local cutaneous skin flaps fall into this category. And then we have regional flaps where the wound is nearby, but not immediately adjacent to the donor site. And then finally, a skin flap is classified by the blood supply. And again, we're gonna see this distinction when we're looking at the CPT codes. In a random pattern flap, the blood supply comes from many small unnamed vessels. And in an axial pattern flap, the blood supply is gonna come from a recognized larger named artery. Okay, so for PCS, the flap procedures are going to be reported using root operation transfer. So that's moving without taking out all or a portion of a body part to another location. And so when the skin flap is still attached to its vascular bed, it would then be coded as a transfer rather than a replacement. And we also have a specific coding guideline that we need to keep in mind when coding the flap procedures. When the flap procedure involves multiple layers of tissue, we would code to the body part value that describes the deepest tissue layer, and then our qualifier value is gonna specify any other tissues that are included. So on our PCS table, we can see that when we transfer the skin, it's pretty straightforward. We don't really have to worry about a qualifier, and our approach defaults to external. But if we look at um, the next example, this is gonna be a muscle flap. So in these cases, our qualifier is gonna represent any other type of tissue that's included, such as the skin and subcutaneous tissue. This is the first case that I had is a 69-year-old female who is admitted for removal of hardware and complex closure. A periperineal flap consisting of myofascial layers was raised and transposed. And so the question is, what is the correct body part value for closed, 
closure using the pericranial flap. And because the pericranial flap consisted of the myofascial layers, we're going to report transfer scalp, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia. Next, we have a 78-year-old man who presents with a non-healing wound over his right lower leg. He did undergo excisional debridement of the Achilles tendon, and then they did a reverse spural fasciocutaneous pedicle flap. So for this one, we're going to assign transfer right lower leg, subcutaneous tissue, and fascia for the reverse spural flap. And then we can also code excision of the lower leg tendon for the excisional debridement. And again, we're reporting that debridement separately because the deeper, the debridement actually went deeper than the flap procedure. Okay, so some related procedures. This scenario is actually a muscle flap. A seven-year-old boy with Noonan syndrome and velopharyngeal insufficiency underwent posterior pharyngeal flap to the soft palate. The posterior pharyngeal flap was suspended to the soft palate oral mucosa. And what is the question is, what is the appropriate, appropriate procedure code? So in this case, we're going to report transfer tongue, palate, pharynx, muscle with the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And this again is a breast reconstruction. The patient is status post left mastectomy for breast cancer. And an uh, ipsilateral tram flap reconstruction was performed. The tram flap was elevated off the abdominal wall and passed through the tunnel into the breast. We're going to assign a code for transfer left abdomen muscle with qualifier value of six to specify the tram flap. This article did go on to say that the root operation transfer was appropriate for the tram reconstruction. In this example, a portion of the abdominal muscle is moved to the breast, but it remains connected to its vascular and nervous supply. Okay, so this is a little bit different in the fact that we're actually removing the tram flap in this case. So the patient is status post bilateral mastectomy and presented for tram flap removal due to a non-viable free flap. So on the left side, she had complete removal of the tram, tram flap, and then on the right side, they removed the inferior portion. So in this case, we're going to code for removal of autologous tissue from both the left and the right breast. Um, the definition of removal is taking out or off a device from a body part. So in this case, since the flap is considered a, a device, we get to root operation removal. And there may also be some cases where we would assign root operation revision if a graft or flap needed to be repaired in some way. Okay, and then we have a patient who had a cleft, rip, uh, cleft lip repair, and they used the Miller technique, which consisted of rotating the medial segment and advancing the lateral flap. So the question is, what is the operation for the cleft lip repair using the Miller rotation advancement technique? So we're going to assign code, uh, code for transfer facial muscle with skin and subcutaneous tissue for the rotation. And then in this case, a muscle flap was anastomosed across the cleft, which covered the defect. And the body part transferred remained connected to its vascular supply. So again, because it remained connected, we're looking at a transfer as our root operation. Okay, so for CPT, we're going to look at coding for the skin flaps. It's going to be a little bit more involved than what we deal with in PTS. In CPT, uh, we do have several different code groups to differentiate the various types of skin flaps. We'll go ahead and start with adjacent tissue transfers, and these are going to be reported with codes 14000 through 14302. These are local flaps that include advancement flaps and rotation flaps, and they contain cutaneous tissue, and the blood supply will be um, based on multiple unnamed vessels rather than that clearly defined axial, axial vessel. So this is where the blood supply um, comes into effect when we're classifying our different flap procedures. So this little illustration that I have here is a good example of how a rotation flap may be used to cover a defect. And then next we have our island pedicle flap. This is going to be reported with codes 15740 and 15750. The island pedicle flap is also a local cutaneous a flap, but in order to report this, we do need that anatomically named axial vessel. So we do need a documentation of that. And this type of procedure, uh, the tissue is typically transferred through a tunnel underneath the skin. So something to keep in mind about the island pedicle flap. Okay, so next in our group is going to be um, more of our regional flap. So the direct or tube pedicle flap is a regional flap. 
This is moved to a non-adjacent body part. These flaps can contain skin, subcutaneous tissue. They may also contain deeper tissue, such as muscle, and they're gonna be reported with codes 15570 through 15738. And in this type of flap procedure, the pedicle end remains attached to the body part. So this um, illustration here is a good example of that, where they have taken a flap from more of a distant body part and then transferred it up to close the defect. Pedicle flaps can be formed, be formed and then transferred later. So we do have some different groups of codes here to um, help different, differentiate that. The um, regions listed refer to the recipient site when the pedicle is formed and transferred. And then the exception to this guideline is when a tube is formed for later transfer, the regions listed refer to the donor site. And like with skin graft guidelines, a primary repair of the donor site is gonna be included but a repair requiring a skin graft or local flap is an additional procedure. And then finally, we have our free flaps. Free flaps don't include a vascular pedicle. So um, these are gonna be reported with codes 15757 and 15758. These, again, are regional flaps and they can contain skin, fascia, or muscle, but because they don't have a pedicle and the flap is completely freed from its blood supply, there is going to be um, some microanastomosis of the vessels that have to take place in order to um, supply that, that flap with, with the blood supply that's needed. Okay, so for, as far as our examples, I wanted to start with this, um, the direct or tube pedicle flap. And in this first example, a cheek to nose flap was performed in two stages. The flap is formed and attached to the nose. And then, so for the first stage of this procedure, we're going to report code 15576 formation of pedicle with or without transfer of the nose. And then after four weeks, the flap is divided and inset. The second stage of this repeat, uh, procedure would be reported with code 15630, delay of flap, division and inset at the eyelids, nose, ears, or lips. So a good example there of how the pedicle flap may work when it's done in two different stages. And this is an example of our island pedicle flap. So this is a patient who had basal cell carcinoma of the ear. It was excised in a postericular flap, which included the dissected postericular artery, was fashioned and tunneled through the ear cartilage to cover the anterior ear. And so we're going to report this with 15740. And again, the island pedicle flap requires the identification of the anatomically named vessel. And in this case, that was the postericular artery. So because we have that vessel, we can go ahead and code this to the island pedicle. Also, we talked about with the island pedicle that these typically are tunneled. And in this case, they did tunnel that through the ear cartilage. So a couple points on that. Um, okay, and then we had a patient with squamous cell carcinoma in two locations. And the patient underwent excision. The excision involved skin, subcutaneous tissue, and cartilage. Then they did a complex repair and closure with advancement of the retroauricular skin. And so the appropriate code for this is going to be 14061. So again, this is our adjacent tissue transfer or rearrangement. And that's going to include the excision and closure using that advancement flap. And then our final example here is a free, the free skin flap that we talked about. And so the question is, is code 49250 pharyngeal plasty reportable in addition to code 15757, which is that free skin flap, and when they're using it to reconstruct both the nick and the tongue defect. So code 49250 would not be reported in addition to the free skin flap. The inner service work of code 49250 is encompassed in that code. And so our free skin flap, the 15757, is gonna include harvesting a donor free flap, insetting the flap using the microsurgical technique and then closure of both the donor and recipient sites. So that 15757 is an all-inclusive code to report that type of procedure. Okay, so we do have some related procedures. This is a patient, um, who had a DIP um, breast reconstruction. So the question was, should code 19364, breast reconstruction with free flap, 
be used to report the performance of the DIP breast reconstruction. And code 19364 is the appropriate code. This code is not limited to a particular type of free flap, so we can use it to report any type of free flap breast reconstruction. And again, this code is going to include the harvesting of, of the flap, any kind of microvascular anastomosis, closure of the donor site, and then um, transfer to the chest. Okay, and then this is a, a code, uh, how would you code for a vertical rectus abdominis musculocutaneous flap harvest for a sternal wound? So they used the rectus fascia closure and then they reinforced it by, um, by an onlay of a biologic implant. So in this case, we can code the 15734 for muscle myocutaneous flap, but we can also add an additional code 1577 which is gonna be implantation of a biological implant, example, an acellular dermal matrix. And this provides that soft tissue reinforcement. So that's a situation where we could have an additional code that goes along with our skin flap code. So that wraps up our skin flap information. And so our last topic for today is gonna to be new technology. So I wanted to start with, we had some new CPT codes effective for January 2020. The first code was 15769, and it's going to be used to report autologous soft tissue grafts, such as fat, dermis, fascia, or other soft tissue. In this case, the tissue is harvested using an excisional technique, and the graft is placed into the defect during the same operation. The other group of codes are the 15771 through 74. These are going to be used to report autologous fat grafting when the adipose cells are harvested via a liposuction technique. They're then injected via cannula into the defect. So for this, the regions listed refer to the recipient area, and the volumes are going to be based on total inject date. And for the multiple sites of injection, we can sum the total volume for those anatomic sites that are grouped together. And these codes should only be reported once per operative session. For I-10, we do have the porcine liver-derived skin substitute, and this isn't actually a new code, but it's still listed as new technology for PCS, so I did include it here. And the Myoderm Biologic is the brand name for the wound matrix that's derived from the porcine liver. The Myoderm is processed to remove cells, which could cause rejection, and it's used for partial and full thickness wounds include things like pressure ulcers or diabetic ulcers, also traumatic wounds. They do not use this particular um, product, though, for third-degree burn. And earlier, I mentioned that cell suspension was a new qualifier. And so a little bit more information about this. During cell suspension, the cells are suspended in an enzyme solution, and it allows them to be separated from the epidermis and the, derm and the dermis. So this technique is specifically used in the recell system. And so they're using the cell suspension technique to break down the layers of skin from a small sample of the patient's own skin. The cells are collected and then they spray it or drip it directly onto the wound. And so the information I found about this was pretty interesting. And what they're saying is that within 30 minutes, the suspension can be used to treat a wound that is 80 times larger than the sample taken. So I thought that was pretty amazing um, that they can do that. Resell is FDA approved in the U.S. and it's, you, it's approved for treatment of acute thermal wounds in patients that are 18 years or older. It is approved for direct application to a partial thickness burn or if it is com combined with a mesh autograph, it can be also used for full thickness thermal burns. And then we have the cell mist technology. This is actually investigational in the U.S., so it hasn't been approved, but this system uses a small sample of the patient's skin as well, and then using the cell suspension, they separate the stem cells from the surrounding tissue. The solution is then placed in the skin gun and sprayed on the wound. So I did include here a picture, picture of the skin gun, which um, looks pretty um, interesting as well. But they're saying that this whole procedure takes about 90 minutes, and they're hopeful that this technology can be used to treat not only acute and chronic 
wounds, but then other skin conditions as well. And one of the ones they mentioned was for uh, treatment of like acne scars and some of those types of things. So this is something that um, we'll probably be seeing a little bit more about as their FDA process continues on. Okay, so then um, again, this is a came from co the most recent coding clinic, so I wanted to include this one as well. This is the Polarity TE skin graft, and this is a patient who had previously undergone placement of autograft and homograft due to full thickness burns. They are now admitted for failure of the graft, so they did remove those previous grafts, and the area was debrided. They um, took a full thickness skin sample, and it was anticipated that the polarity skin grafting would take place. So during the admission, they did go ahead and place the full thickness polarity skin graft. And so they're asking, what is the appropriate root operation for the application? We're going to assign the appropriate code for the full thickness autologous tissue substitute, and it's going to be a root operation replacement. And so a little bit more information about this process. Uh, it was from what I can understand, they take the full thickness skin sample and they package it up, they send it to the Polarity Biomedical Manufacturing Facility, uh, they manufacture the graft, and then they're saying that it gets returned to the provider within 48 to 72 hours. The material, the, the graft is actually contained in a syringe, and then they take that and they apply it directly to the wound, and they go ahead and cover it with a dressing. And um, the polarity skin tea can be used for acute and chronic wounds, surgical reconstruction, uh, scar revision, and any kind of traumatic injuries as well. And they, this technology has been shown to regenerate all layers of the skin, but also it can regenerate the sweat glands and the hair follicles as well. So this kind of gives you an idea of what the process looks like from harvest and then to the manufacturing facility and then once it gets applied to that patient's wound. So again, a very interesting process there. Um, and so um, some of the things that they can do with the skin products and some of the substitutes um, is really great and they just keep continuing to find better and better ways to do that. So that is all that we have for today. So that includes my information. Um, Sharon, I don't know, it looks like we do have some time if we have some questions that we want to go through. Thank you, Lori. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, I'll read the first one. It says, in ICD-10 PCS, I thought extraction is used for non-excisional debridement along with replacement for the skin graft, uh, or sorry, for the graft. So could you maybe clarify or so yeah and I believe that is correct that, that the non-excisional debridement but would be used with the extraction we aren't able though to code the non-excisional debridement along with the skin graft because the um, the reason why on the other examples we were able to code the excisional debridement along with the skin graft is because the debridement actually went deeper than what the skin graft was so that allow us, allowed us to code an additional procedure, but with the non-excisional, because it's the same level as the skin graft, it would then be included, so it wouldn't be an additional procedure. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. How do we know when to code with and without skin or subcutaneous tissues during palatoplasty? <clears throat> what kind of language would we expect to see in the OR? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, and it definitely is going to um, depend on the documentation, and it might be a little bit tricky. Um, I've seen some good uh, documentation of that, but a lot of times, unfortunately, we don't always get really good documentation on what other layers are included. Um, so that might be a situation where we would have to query because we would need the physician to let us know. You know, if they're if they're all the way down to the muscle, and they're you know using that. Did they did they include the skin, the subcutaneous tissue? I think a lot of times they do, but I would definitely not say that's you know across the board. So if the documentation isn't clear, I think it would be a situation where we would need to query. Awesome, thank you. I think that is it for questions. Um, so everybody on the call, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Lori, is there one last slide at the end with a link? 
I thought there was, but you know what? I'm not seeing it on here, Sharon. I'm okay. sorry. I think I might no, have used no the worries. wrong copy. <laughs> no worries. Um, so in, I'll be sending out an email to everybody who attended today's webinar. Um, that email will contain the handouts. It will contain a link to the recording of the webinar so you can um, watch it again or share it with coworkers. Um, and it will also contain that link to a brief evaluation. So once you click on that evaluation um, and submit it, you'll be able to download your CEU. For anybody who um, is watching this as a recording, and this is not live, um, the URL to obtain your CEU is www.truecode.com, that's T-R-U-C-O-D-E.com, forward slash skin graph. CEU. Uh, but for everybody on the live presentation, I will be sending this to you via email, so no need to record it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we really appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar.